as Pam mentioned, um, we're going to be taking a tour of the Groby Optimizer in the next hour. Um, let me start off by making sure that everyone is in the right place. So what is the Groby Optimizer? Um, it's a library for solving linear and mixed integer programming problems, LPs and MIPS. Um, we're actually going to be adding quadratic programming, QP and MIQP in version 4.0, which is due out in November. Um, so the Groby Optimizer includes uh, the simplex and barrier algorithms for um, solving continuous models. And we also have a parallel branch and cut algorithm for solving mixed integer programming models. Um, and our library is available for Windows, um, all variants, all recent variants, I should say, 32-bit, um, 64-bit. Uh, also available for Linux, 32-bit and 64-bit for um, the most popular distributions, uh, Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu. And we also have a version for the Macintosh. So let me, uh, let me take a second to just uh, uh, talk about what we have planned for this tour. Uh, the tour is going to be divided into three parts. The first part will be an overview of the interfaces to the Groby Optimizer. Um, second part is going to be a detailed look at how you would actually build a program in the programming interfaces, specifically in the matrix-oriented interfaces and the object-oriented interfaces. Um, and then I will look uh, I'll talk quickly about how you would use Garobi through a popular modeling language like Ample or GAMS or MPL. Goals for the tour. Uh, so we have uh, we have a few goals that uh, we hope to achieve by the by the end of this tour. Uh, the first is to give you a sense of the fastest way to get started using Garobi. Uh, we also want to give you a sense of how to do rapid prototyping to quickly do run in models, do simple experiments. Uh, I want to give you a basic understanding of the interfaces that we provide. Um, I want to give you some, some notion of how you can use Groby through a modeling system. And then we also want to give you an uh, overview of how you might migrate a model from, any, from another solver to Groby. So let's get started with the tour. So the first part, as I mentioned, is I want to talk at a high level about all of the interfaces that we provide to the Groby Optimizer. Oops, sorry. Um, so the, the the set of interfaces is listed here. I'll go through these one at, uh, one at a time, and then I'll have a slide for each of these um, coming up. Um, so the first interface uh, that we provide to the to the optimizer is just a simple command line interface. You just type a command, hit return. If you have a model stored in a file, you hit return, and the optimizer starts solving the model in that file produces a log file, gives you a very quick way to get started. You can install the product and be solving a model in a file in five minutes. Uh, the next interface is the interactive shell, which gives you more control. It allows you to do more than just uh, read in a file and solve the model. I'll talk more about that. Um, the programming interfaces, so if you want to call Garobi from a, from a program, uh, we have interfaces for object-oriented languages, C++, Java, .NET, and Python. And then we also have a matrix-oriented interface from the C language. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you can also call Groby from the uh, from a variety of modeling systems, Ames, Ample, GAMS, and MPL. Um, there are also another uh, a variety of other uh, third-party interfaces. So you can call Groby from Excel through the front line. Um, uh, through the front line uh, system, uh, you can call Groby through MATLAB uh, through uh, product from a company called TomLab. Uh, Microsoft Solver Foundation. Uh, this is actually Microsoft's optimization environment. Um, we're actually the default uh, MIP solver within Solver Foundation. So if you build and solve a MIP model inside Solver Foundation, you're, you're using the Groby Optimizer. All right, so now let me talk uh, a bit in a bit more detail about each of these interfaces. So the first one I mentioned is the command line interface. The command line interface is just a simple way, if you've got a model in a file, to just uh, get a sense of uh, whether that, whether, what it takes to solve that model. So you basically just type the name of the command is Groby CL, or Groby underscore CL. Uh, you can specify one or more parameter changes uh, on your command line. And then the final argument is just the name of the file that contains the model. So for example, Groby CL heuristics equals 0.1 glass4.mps. 
So heuristics is a Groby parameter. Uh, in this case, you want to set it to 0 0.1. So you want to use a non-default uh, value for this parameter. So, um, so what is the interactive? Sh uh, sorry, what is the command line interface useful for? Uh, well, basically, it's just a it's just a the, the simplest, most basic way to run a test. So you can check to see how long it takes to solve a model. You can experiment with different parameters for solving a model. It's just a it's just a very simple way to uh, to get started. Uh, so so the um, when you run the command line interface, it generates a log file automatically uh, called groby.log by by default. But there's actually a parameter that allows you to change the name of the log file. Um, and in that log file, we put uh, all the information that we put out to the screen. Uh, so it gives you a uh, gives you a record of the of the progress of the optimization. Uh, we also include the version of Gorobi that was used to solve the model, and also the t the date and time at which you ran uh, the optimization. So this allows you to go back and uh, uh, browse a record of the various runs you made. Um, you know, look look at the results. Uh, maybe maybe uh, use it to to um, perform further runs in the future. Another thing you can do is you can actually uh, write out a solution. This is uh, this is ha handled through a parameter. So there's a result file parameter. So in this case, uh, in this example here, we're, we're doing the same thing we did before. We're changing the heuristics parameter to a value of 0 0.1. And we're also going to write a result file, glass4.sol. Um, and this file has, for each uh, variable in the model, it has a single line in the file. And the line shows the name of the variable and the value of that variable in the solution that's computed by the optimizer. All right, well, what if you want more control? So we also offer an interactive shell. Um, our interactive shell is actually a complete programming environment. So it actually has as much power as, uh, as any programming language does. Uh, the interactive shell is based on objects. Uh, you can use it to uh, read in a file and work with that file. You can also actually build models. So you can start with nothing, create an empty model, add variables, add constraints, uh, all in an interactive fashion. Um, so when would you use this instead of the command line interface? Well, basically, if you want to interact with the optimizer. Command line interface just allows you to fire off the optimizer, and then when it's done, the, your session is over. Uh, with the interactive shell, you can read in the model, you can modify the model, you can solve it, you can stop the solution, you can examine variables, you can restart the solution, you can do some basic uh, reporting of the solution. Um, you've got a you've got a, a, a wide variety of options, and, and in fact, our interactive uh, shell actually exposes all of the features, all the capabilities of the Groby optimizer. So anything you can do with Groby, you can do through the interactive shell. Another thing that's um, that's nice about the interactive shell is um, there's some applications that use optimization through files. Basically, they write out a file that contains their model, and they fire up the optimizer through some shell command, and then the optimizer uh, outputs a solution file, and the user application just goes and parses this file to, to retrieve the uh, solution. Um, so the interactive shell can be used in a similar way. However, um, you can actually write it. You, you can write an interactive shell script that will actually solve the model and pull out whatever information you like from the solution. And so, rather than having to go and parse whatever um, format the the solver produces for the solution, you can actually go and create your own custom solution formats. You can actually go and print out into a file or wherever the the information that you want, rather than having to pull it out from some uh, some 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 other file format. Let me give you a simple example of what it what it looks like to use the Groby shell. Um, so this is a four-line example. First line, m equals read a firo.mps. So a firo.mps is a file that contains an a model. In this case, it's a, a, linear, a linear model. So read is a command that reads the contents of that file and creates a model object, and that model object gets put in the variable m. M.optimize. Optimize is a method on M, so basically optimizes the model. And then M.status is a, it's, we call it an attribute. It's a, it's, it's a property of the model. In this case, the status attribute tells you what the status of the most recent optimization on that model was. So 
in this case we're doing an if statement if the status was optimal so if we solved if this optimized call solved the model to optimality then we invoke another um, method on this on this model on, on m m dot print attribute which prints the value of the in this case the x attribute so basically what this does is x is the um, the solution and so what this does is it prints the solution for the um, for the model, the computed solution for the model. So I mentioned that um, the Groby interactive shell is a programming language. So let me give you a quick example of what you can do with this programming language. So here's the same example from before. You read the model from a file, you optimize it, you check to see if the status is optimal. And then here, what we're doing is we're looping over all the variables in the model. So m.getVars returns a list of all the variables in m. In this for loop here, this just iterates over all the members of that list. So v is iterates over all the mem all the variables. And then for each variable, we print v.varName, v.x, and v.rc. So v.varName is an attribute. Uh, varName is an attribute to the variable, which is the, the name. It's a string. v.x that's the attribute I mentioned earlier, which is the solution value. And v.rc, that's the reduced cost for the variable. And so, you know, as you can imagine, you could easily modify that. You can add an if test. You could, you know, selectively print things. You could print whatever, uh, whatever attributes you like. You can iterate over variables, iterate over constraints. Uh, basically, you have a tremendous amount of flexibility in, and freedom in the interactive shell to basically do uh, whatever, you, whatever you like. Anything you can do with Groby, you can do from the interactive shell. Um, so as I mentioned, the interactive shell, it's a programming language. So in the example, read was, a, was just a function. Uh, model is an object. Model.optimize, model of print attribute. These are methods on the, on the model object. Um, so we didn't actually go and create a brand new programming language. The world doesn't need another programming language. Um, what we did was we based our interactive shell on Python. Well, in fact, we built it inside of Python. So I don't know if you're familiar with Python. Python is a, actually a, it's a, a very powerful and very popular interactive um, programming language. It's a, a scripting language. Um, so it's it's a modern language. It's actually um, um, it's like, but there's a there's a group that keep, tries to keep track of the popularity of different programming languages called uh, Tayobi, and uh, they by their measure Python is actually the seventh most popular programming language out there. It's just slightly less popular than C sharp, so it's quite a widely used language. Um, it's got all the modern features you'd you'd, you'd like in a uh, programming language. It's got dynamic typing. It's got automatic memory management. It's object oriented. You can define classes. Basically, it's a it's a full fledged programming language. That where but it's also a scripting language, so you can actually, you can just type. Uh, one of the nice things about Python is that um, there there's a huge variety of uh, library routines available in Python. And so if you want to build an application in Python, generally it's a matter of finding the library that, um, that supports the, the various things you want to do, and then just calling the appropriate routines from those libraries. So for example, there's a library for, for doing database access. Um, there's a library for building, well, actually, there's several different libraries for building GUI-based applications libraries for doing HTTP queries, um, you name it, there's a, there's a library for it. And as you might imagine, the Groby interactive shell is really just a library inside Python. And so just like the, um, the database library gives you a set of routines that allows you to query databases, uh, the Groby interactive shell gives you a set of routines that allow you to build and solve math programming models. Okay, so that's the interactive shell. Now I will talk a bit about the Groby programming interfaces. So if you want to use Groby from a programming language, so if you're using C, we offer a matrix-based programming interface. So you're specifying your constraints AX as AX equals B, where A is a matrix and X and B are vectors. And so in the C interface, you are basically populating the non-zero values in the matrix A. We have object-oriented interfaces from C++, Java, .NET, and Python. 
Um, and so if you're if you're building an application using a programming language, these are the interfaces you would you would use. So what do these interfaces look like? Well, in a in a one hour presentation, I'm certainly not going to go through uh, six different programming language APIs. Um, the main thing I want to say is that um, we've had actually we've had quite a bit of experience working with people who are using these interfaces to build applications. And generally what they say is that if you've used another solver that our interfaces are quite familiar. And so when it comes to the interfaces, there's more similarities to other solvers than there are differences. So rather than just go through the similarities one by one, I'll just talk about a few of the important differences, the ones that you're likely to run into. Um, the important differences, uh, there, there are really three. The first is in how we deal with environments, and specifically how we deal with parameters. Um, the second is in how we deal with modifications to the model. We take an approach called lazy updates. I'll talk about that a bit more. And finally, another difference is in how we deal with um, uh, properties of the model. Um, things like lower bounds, upper bounds, right-hand sides. Um, and what we've decided to do in our interface is uh, we access all these through a, through, a, through a common interface we call an attribute interface. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. All right, so when it comes to environments. So environments are generally used to set parameters. So you set a parameter on an environment, um, and then when you solve the model, the, the model picks up the change parameters from that environment. Um, a model is associated with an environment, typically. Um, the one difference between from our interface and other interfaces is that in our interface, a model, when it's created, it gets a copy of the global environment. Um, so this, the, the reason we do this is it, it makes it much easier to work with multiple different models, and in particular, multiple different sets of parameters. And so in other solvers, you have a, generally have a single environment, and if you want to work with two different sets of parameters, you have to either keep track of which ones you changed and change them back from one to the other, or you have to create multiple environments, which actually potentially leads to other issues. Um, in our interface, basically, once you create a model, it gets a copy of the environment. And so any changes to that environment are not, do not affect the other models that you've created. Um, so the so the upside, of course, as I mentioned, is that you can work with multiple different sets of parameters. The downside is you have to remember to make the when you make a parameter change, you have to make it to the right environment. Um, and so there are really two different environments. Generally, if you ha if you're working it with one model, there are generally two different environments you need to worry about. There's the global environment, and this environment is whenever you create a new model, the global environment is where the new model will get its parameter settings from. So it will make a copy of the global environment when it's created. Um, if you have an existing model, then if you want to change parameters for that model, you have to change the parameters on the environment associated with that model. So that model's copy of the environment. So we have a method called getEnv, which allows you to get the environment for a particular model. So you want to change parameters that, uh, for a particular model, you should you should call you need to remember to call getEnv to make sure you get the environment associated with that model. Okay, the other difference that I mentioned is lazy updates. So um, when you want to modify a model, uh, in, in the Groby interface, what you do is you, you, you specify various modification commands. Uh, you know, you modify the right-hand side, you add a constraint, you add a variable, what have you. And these commands do not have an immediate effect on the model. So if you make a set of modification changes, uh, after you've made that set of changes, the model is not is not is not changed. The change only occurs once you call a function called update. So why did we do this in this way? Well, um, basically, what this allows you to do is it allows you to 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 have the modification routines be extremely quick and extremely efficient. So all they're doing is essentially queuing up a set of requested changes. Um, and then when you call update, this, what, what this lazy update approach allows us to look at all the changes that are pending for the model and to do them in the most efficient way. So uh, basically the, 
the cost of the various interface routines is quite predictable and quite understandable to you as the user. Uh, a, ch a change routine, a, a, a routine that, that uh, changes the model, the runtime is going to be extremely quick. And the update routine, it's basically calling update is going to take a bit of time because potentially you're going to rebuild the entire model. However, you, you, know, you have control over when you call the update. And so generally, if you know, you generally you you, uh, you should call it. Uh, you shouldn't call it that frequently. Um, so <clears throat> this uh, this is one difference that potentially requires changes if you're migrating from another solver. Um, we've had we've had quite a bit of experience with this, as you might imagine. And um, what we found is that um, if you're just building a program where you just build a model, solve it, extract the solution, and then you're done. Um, basically, this it doesn't re really require any work at all. Uh, there's really not much thought that's involved in migrating if this is all you're doing. Um, if you're if you're if you have a program that is building a model, uh, taking extracting the solution, you know, modifying the model, and solving it again, and extracting another solution. If, if you're doing an iterative sort of process, then potentially you need to think about when you're doing the updates, um, and that is potentially more involved. However. Generally, what we found is pe people say that it takes takes a matter of a couple hours to migrate to uh, the update approach. So it's not a it's not a major not a major effort. So the third difference I mentioned is attributes. Um, so we we uh, use this attribute approach because we we think it really cleans up our APIs, uh, makes them much more similar to each other, um, easier to learn, and just a lot smaller, a lot more concise. Um, and so this, this attribute interface, it's really the same across all of our interfaces. C, C++, Java.net, Python, Interactive Shell, all of them. Um, and the basic notion here is that we have a set of, so attributes refer to um, properties of the model. So for example, the number of variables in the model is an attribute of the model. Uh, the lower bound in a variable is an attribute of the variable. Um, and Basically, we have a we have a list of attributes, of names of attributes, and then in each interface we have a get. We have a set of get and set functions. And so, basically, if you know the name of the attribute and you know the and, and you know how to call the get or set function, then you know how to uh, how to uh, retrieve or modify that that attribute. Um, and so, rather than in in some interfaces, you'll find dozens of routines, you know, get x, get pi, get this, get that. And often what you'll find is that they're highly non-uniform. And so, um, you know, you may have a get x routine that returns the solution, and you can give it a list of indices, but if you, you may have a get uh, reduced cost routine where you can only get the, the full list. You can't, you can't give it a set of indices. You can only get the dense list. Um, in our approach, we have a set of get and set functions. We have a list of attribute names, and they're orthogonal. Basically, you can you can use any of those get or set functions on any of those attribute names, and uh, they all work in the expected way. So we have a full list of uh, attributes in the in our reference manual. I, I'll I'll just show you a selected set now. So the model itself has a set of attributes. There's a you know number of variables in the model, number of constraints, number of non-zeros. These are all attributes of the model. Um, another attribute is the solve time, the amount of time that was taken by the most recent call to um, optimize. The uh, model has a solution status, so for the most recent call to optimize, did the solver fi find the optimal solution? Was, it, was the model proved infeasible? Was it unbounded, etc.? The variables have attributes as well. Um, the solution value in the most recently computed solution is an attribute of a variable. The variable upper bound, variable lower bound, uh, objective, objective coefficients, variable types, whether the variable is continuous, binary, integer, etc. Um, similarly, constraints have attributes as well: right-hand side value, slack value, dual variable, etc. Okay. So um, now let me move on to now I've I've talked at a high level about the interfaces. Now let me let me talk um, about some examples. I'll actually go through an example in C, a matrix API example. And then I will also go through an object-oriented uh, example. I, I'll go through the Java, a Java example. However, the, the other object-oriented interfaces look very similar. 
So here's the model we're going to be optimizing in the example. Maximize x plus y plus 2z subject to a pair of linear constraints on those three variables. And the three variables are all binary. Um, so this is actually one of the examples from our distribution. Um, our, di our distribution actually includes 18 examples for each language. And so what we've done is we've taken, we've created a set of 18 examples and then translated them to all of our uh, supported languages, including C Sharp and Visual Basic. Um, so this is this is probably the simplest one from the set. So first, I will talk about the C interface. Um, before I before I actually um, show the example for the C interface, I need to talk a bit about how you specify a constraint matrix in the, in the C interface. So you generally use something called compressed sparse row or compressed sparse column format. Um, the, the the important notion here is that when you're specifying a constraint matrix for a math programming problem, generally most of the non sorry most of the values in this matrix are zero. And so in the interface, rather than requiring you to say this entry is zero, this entry is zero, this entry is zero, we basically just um, ask you to specify which entries in the matrix are not zero. And you do this using something called compressed sparse row or compressed sparse column format. Um, I'll give you an example in a second, but basically it's a way to specify a list of non-zero, a sparse list of non-zero values. So if you're adding a constraint, you're going to use this compressed sparse row format. And if you're adding a variable, you're going to use compressed sparse column format to specify the, the non-zero values in the corresponding column. Um, so these are these are the standard approach. This is the standard approach used to represent the um, a sparse matrix by uh, essentially all of the um, math programming solvers out there. Um, basically, you just use you're, you're just using a pair of, of arrays to represent a set of non-zero values. So you have uh, two parallel arrays, a uh, double precision array which gives the coefficients, and an integer array which for each coefficient gives the index that that non-zero value appears in, in the corresponding row or column. So let me, let me go through an example now. So here we have, um, this is actually, this example starts um, after the environment and the model have been created. So I left off that part of the code. Um, so at this point, at the beginning of this code here, you have an empty model, zero variables and zero constraints. First thing we're going to do is we're going to add three variables to the model, x, y, and z. So we're going to specify objective coefficients for these variables. So the default is minimization, so we multiply the, the, uh, the, the example maximizes, so we multiply the coefficients, the objective coefficients by minus one. So um, the objective zero is minus one, the objective one is, is minus one, and the objective two is minus two. So one thing I should note here is that we we had to specify, we had to choose indices for each of the variables in our model, column numbers essentially. So we have chosen to use column number zero for x, column number one for y, and column number two for z. Um, so this mapping is, it, it's arbitrary. It's entirely in your head. The only requirement really is that you use the same mapping throughout your program. Um, so, you know, we could have had, we could have had Z as column zero and Y as column one and X as column two if we wanted to, but we chose, we chose uh, X as column zero and Z as column two. All right. So then the next thing we're going to specify is the types of the variables. They're all binary. And then we're going to call add vars. We're going to add three variables to the model. Um, this portion here indicates that we're not going to actually add any non-zero values. To the, to the coefficient matrix associated with these three variables. Um, but we are going to specify the objective, which we built above, and we're going to specify the types of the variables, which we also specified above. Um, the uh, advars command, several of the arguments are, um, you are, have default values. So if you just pass null, we'll just use the defaults. So one of these is the lower bounds, and the other is the upper bounds in the variables. Since they're all binary, basically we can use the defaults, which are you know, lower bound zero and upper bound one. Okay, the next thing we need to do is um, we need to call update model. Remember that a request to modify the model has no effect until you call update. Um, so once we've called update, it will take the pending request to add three variables and it will add them to the model. And at this point, you will have a model that contains three variables and no constraints. 
the next step is to add the constraints. First constraint, x plus 2y plus 3z less than or equal 4. So this is where we use compressed sparse row format. We have two parallel arrays, ind and val. And so what this says here is that the first non-zero entry in, in this row um, has a uh, has a value of 1.0, the val sub zero is, is one, and is in column number zero. So basically it's saying x, x which is in column number zero, has a coefficient of, of 1.0. Second pair here says uh, the value of the second non-zero in, in, in this row is 2.0, and it appears in column 1. So in other words, y has a coefficient of 2.0. Similarly, z has a coefficient of 3.0, and it's in column number 2. So now that we've built this compressed sparse row representation of our row in the matrix, we call add constraint. We're going to add cons a constraint which has, th which has three non-zero values in the, in the corresponding row in the constraint matrix, specified in the ind and val arrays. And it's a less than or equal constraint, and the right-hand side is 4.0. And we can also specify a name for this constraint, which is called C0 in this case. Okay, so at this point we've added one constraint to the model. And then uh, this, uh, this code here adds the second constraint to the model. It's very similar. The only real difference is uh, we're adding two non-zeros instead of three. And in this case, it's a greater than or equal constraint instead of, instead of a less than constraint. All right, now the next step is to optimize the model. So you may note that I've skipped the update step. Uh, we, made the, we made the assumption in our interface that uh, when you call optimize, basically you want to apply all of the pending updates. So we just the first thing we do when we, uh, when we, uh, when we, when we start an optimization is to update the model. Okay, so this uh, optimize will then optimize that model. And then once the optimization is complete, then we want to uh, extract some information about the, about the solution. And so this is where we use the attribute interface. So we're going to extract three attributes from the model. We're going to extract the status attribute, which is the status of the optimization, whether it was solved, whether the model was solved optimality, whether it was proved to be infeasible, what, what have you. We're going to extract the objective value, which is the, um, the, object, the, the value of the objective function for the solution that was computed. And we're going to extract x, which is the solution vector. And these, are the, um, these here are the C routines for querying attribute values. So in this case, we have get int attribute. Status is an integer attribute. Um, so we're going to query the status and put it in our local variable optim status. Uh, dub, um, objective value is a double attribute, so we're going to query the objective value and put it into local variable obj_val. So now note that x here is a vector. It contains one entry for each variable in the model, and we actually have a set of uh, query routine, attribute query routines in C that allow you to query the values of vector-valued attributes. So in this case, we're just going to use a get attribute get double attribute array, it's a double double precision attribute. Um, and what, what we're saying here is we want to get the value of this attribute starting from index zero, and we want to get three values, which x, y, and z. And we want to put them into SOL as a local array that has at least three entries in it. Okay, so that is the, that's the matrix example. Um, now I'll talk about an object-oriented example. So in our object-oriented interfaces, of course, um, everything is represented as an object. So we have an object for the model. Each variable has an object associated with it. Each constraint has an object associated with it. And then we have methods on these objects to, you know, for example, we have methods on the model to create variables, create constraints. We have methods on the variables to query and modify attributes, etc. So, returning to our simple example from before, first step is to create three variables in the model. Again, I've skipped the steps of creating the environment and creating the model. So this, this code starts at the point where you have an empty model. And so we just add three variables. We, we, just, we just add three variables to the model. Uh, the arguments here give the lower bound, upper bound, objective coefficient, the type of the variable, and the name of the variable. 
And then again, once we've done that, we call model.update to integrate these three new variables into the model. We add our linear constraints. Um, uh, Object-oriented interfaces are generally a lot easier to, uh, to, to read, to maintain, to work with. So um, as, you, as, you can probably, as you can probably see. So in this example here, we have a linear expression object. We create a new empty linear expression object. We add three terms to it, 1.0 times x, 2.0 times y, and 3.0 times z. And then we add a constraint, express in less than or equal 4.0. So one thing that's nice about the object-oriented interfaces is, um, unlike the C interface, um, you don't have to put all, your, um, all, all the terms of your expression on the left-hand side. So we could have also said model.addConstraint 4.0 greater than or equal expression. Or we could have had two expressions and said this expression is equal that expression. Um, you have a lot more a lot more flexibility in how you work with expressions in the object-oriented interfaces. So here's the uh, second constraint. Again, you create a new expression, you add two terms to it, and then you add a constraint associated associated with that uh, expression. The next step is to call optimize again, and then finally we want to print the solution. So again, we're going to query attributes, and we're going to print the values of those attributes. Uh, in the object-oriented interfaces, each of the, um, each of the objects is going to have a get method and a, and a set method. So in this case, we have a variable x. We're going to call the get method, and we're going to get the variable name, the var name attribute. So we're going to get the name of the variable. And then here, we're going to, in the next, in the next line, we're going to get the value of the x attribute, which is the solution value attribute. And then we just use the Java print statement to print the name and the solution value for each of the variables x, y, and z. So again, this is the this is the attribute interface. All right. So those are very quick um, overviews of a very simple example. I, I hope to I hope I just hope to give you a sense of how um, how you'd use the various interfaces. Um, one question we get fairly often is, um, which interface should I use? You know, is there some advantage to one interface over the other? Um, and I mean, there are a few general guidelines. You know, the object-oriented interfaces are generally easier to use. Um, they, they're easier to read, easier to maintain. Um, the, you know, the, the Python interface, Python is an interpreted language. And so if you're doing a lot of computation in, uh, in the process of building your model, that is potentially going to, it's going to go slower. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're going to do a lot of uh, computation in order to build your model, uh, there's potentially going to be performance effect from using uh, in interpreted language. Um, other than that, basically we've designed all of our interfaces to be extremely light um, and extremely efficient. Um, and really, I mean, really, all they are is just a very thin layer sitting on top of our C interface. And so while it's true that the C interface is the lowest common denominator, and so if you work directly in the C interface, you can't get any more efficient than that, because that's what everyone else, uh, that's what all the interfaces pass the data to. At the same time, the interface, the, the object-oriented interfaces are really just passing data through. They're not really doing sub significant work. And so there's really very little overhead associated with the, any of these interfaces. So really, the interface you should use is the, you know, it, it's, it, you should use the interface for the language that you're most comfortable with. Um, so there's not really much in terms of a reason. It, it, there aren't really any efficiency or memory considerations, significant memory considerations when it comes to any of these interfaces. OK, so now I will um, talk a bit about using Groby through modeling languages. Um, so uh, the, the quick version of this is that modeling systems are designed to be solver independent. And so they're designed to allow you to choose a solver. So there's really, there's really not much to it. And so uh, you, well, you have to obtain a license for Gorobi. And then all the, sol all the modeling languages have a method for uh, selecting a solver, uh, either through an IDE or through, a, through, the, through the model file. Um, another thing you may need to do is set parameters. Parameters are um, you know, solver-specific. And again, the modeling environments have mechanisms for setting solver-specific parameters. This is, just, you know, they, they're used to working with multiple solvers. 
And so, um, to be more specific, here are examples of how you would select Groby from a variety of different modeling environments. Um, I'm not going to go through these in any detail. Basically, if you see your favorite modeling environment here, I'll just leave this up for a second. You can look at the steps that are involved in order to select Groby. Similarly, if you want to set parameters, um, again, you know, if if you see your favorite modeling in, uh, in modeling language here, just uh, have a look at what's required in order to set a parameter. It's it's really it's really quite simple. All right. Finally, um, when it comes to migrating programs from another solver to Groby. As you might imagine, we've had quite a bit of experience with this, working with people who are doing this. Um, and the one thing I can say is when it comes to the C interface, the matrix interface, um, the, the comments we've gotten are that the migration is quite easy. Um, uh, if you've got a matrix that's stored in compressed sparse row or compressed sparse column format, basically our interface routines take, take the same data. So it's just a matter of finding the appropriate mapping from the other solver routine to our routine. Um, as I mentioned, uh, lazy updates can be an issue if you are making, if you're, if you're iteratively modifying a model. Um, it require, it, it can require a bit of thought. Um, however, feedback has been that it's, um, it's a pretty simple matter. It's just a matter of a couple hours to, uh, to insert the appropriate update commands. Um, when it comes to the object-oriented interfaces, um, the, the story is a bit more complex because each solver has its own object model, um, and, and well, they're, they're not the same. Um, and so you do, rather than just a mechanical process of mapping one routine name to the other, which is basically what you need to do in the C interface, um, in the object-oriented interfaces, you do need to think about how the objects from one uh, solver would map onto our objects. Um, now, our interface is quite small, it's quite concise, it's quite light, and so generally it's, it's, it's quite easy to understand our object model and uh, to understand what, it, what it's going to take to implement a model on top of this, uh, on top of this object model. Um, however, it does require a bit of thought. So um, I mean, generally the feedback we've gotten is that uh, a simple object-oriented model is a migrated and you know, takes anywhere from a couple hours to maybe a day or two. Um, so if you want more details on um, migrating from, an, from another solver to Gorobi, we actually have a presentation that is geared specifically to this. Uh, it's available on our website, so you can, just, uh, you can just go and download it if you'd like. So um, now let me review the goals we had for the tour. Um, so first goal that I mentioned up front was uh, I wanted to give you a sense of the fastest way to get started with Gorobi. Um, and really the fastest way, there's no, there's no faster way than just if you've got a model sitting in a file, you just use the command line interface, Groby underscore CL, and then the name of the model, hit return, and boom, you're solving the model using the Groby optimizer. Um, the interactive shell uh, requires a bit more work. Uh, you have to type, you know, you have to type a read command and an optimize command, but still, it's quite, uh, quite quick. It's uh, quite easy to get started. All right, so how would you do rapid prototyping in Groby? Well, the Groby interactive shell is a great way to do um, prototyping, testing. Um, so one thing I can say is that for our own internal algorithm testing, uh, we, we write essentially all of our tests using the Python shell. Um, we find that it's probably a factor 10 more productive than writing tests in any of the uh, other programming interfaces. And the reason is simply that um, in you know in the interactive shell in Python you can you can just sit at the shell and you can just type commands. So as you're sitting there, you can you know you can write a new test, or you can uh, you can you can solve a model, modify the model, look at the solution. Um, you can it, it's quite useful to be able to interact with the model when you're building a test, so that you can get a better sense of uh, of, of what's happening, a very hands-on, uh, immediate sense of exactly what's happening. So the understanding of the interfaces uh, that are available in the Groby solver. So I went through an examples of the object-oriented interface. Um, well, I actually went through a Java example, but as I mentioned, the C++, .NET, and Python 
APIs are actually extremely similar. Um, and then I also went through an example of the C interface. Um, how so getting a sense of how Gorobi connects to the modeling modeling system as well as I mentioned it's it's really very simple modeling systems are built to uh, work with multiple solvers so basically you just uh, you just uh, select Gorobi and you're off and running and then migrating a model from another solver to Gorobi so as I mentioned there's a um, presentation on our website so I if you're interested I encourage you to download it and go through it. One thing before I finish, uh, so the overview I've given um, has touched on how to build and solve a model. I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's all you can do with the Groby Optimizer. So let me just talk about a few additional Groby features. So uh, Groby offers IIS in feasibility detection uh, for both continuous and integer models. So if you have an infeasible model, first thing you typically want to know is why is it infeasible? And IIS stands for Irreducible Infeasible Subsystem. So what this does is it takes your infeasible model and it whittles it down to a much smaller model that's also infeasible. And so the, the intent is that if you, if, you, if, you, if you can look at a much smaller model and see that that's infeasible, you can, you can often figure out why it's infeasible. And get a get a sense for how to remove the infeasibility and fix fix your model. Um, so Groby Optimizer offers a, a variety of callbacks, so you can actually monitor the progress of your optimization as it's running, and you can actually affect the um, the, the process that's used. Um, these callbacks are available from all of the languages, including actually the interactive shell. So you can actually write your own custom callback for your own private version of the interactive shell, and you know every time you run a model in your shell, you could print out you could print out additional information. Um, so callbacks, we have information callbacks allow you to track the progress of the optimization. Uh, we have a cutting plane callback. So if you have if you have knowledge of the structure of your mixed integer programming problem, you can add your own custom cutting planes. We have a heuristic callback. It allows you to, if if you have a um, if you have a way to compute heuristic solutions for your model, you can in, inject them into the Groby MIP solver, and the uh, MIP solver will use them. Um, we also allow you to specify uh, MIP start val values. So when you formulate a MIP model, you can also give the Groby optimizer a feasible solution uh, obtained through some heuristic that uh, you know is, is appropriate for your model. And then the Groby MIP solver will start with that solution and try to improve it, which can uh, which which can lead to faster solution times. And then we also have a full range of LP sensitivity information, uh, sensitivity to changes in var variable bounds, objective coefficients, right hand sides, etc. So um, if you if you'd like additional information. Uh, so all of our documentation is available online at Gorobi.com. So the three documents that we uh, that we distribute as part of our documentation, the first is a quick start guide. Um, it just gives you a very quick introduction to the command line interface, the interactive shell, and then it just goes through a very simple example in each of the supported programming languages. We also have a reference manual that gives uh, full details on all the interfaces. Um, and then we have an example tour. So I mentioned we distribute 18 examples for each of our programming languages. So these examples were designed to illustrate how you would do certain common things that are done in optimization models. And so what the example tour does is it, it, it goes through a list of the common sorts of things you do in, optim in when, when, when doing optimization, and it points you to the examples that illustrate these uh, um, these these tasks. Uh, so finally, um, uh, the, on our website, we uh, we distribute a free trial. Um, I'm guessing most of you have probably already grabbed the free trial, but if you haven't, um, it's, uh, it's it's free. It features it has all the features of the Groby product. So there's nothing missing. The only difference between the free trial and the full product is that the free trial has a limit on the size of the model you can solve. Um, and then 
Uh, we also offer free academic licenses. So if you are an academic and would like to use Groby, you can get a free license that has no limits whatsoever. So it's basically the full product. Okay, so that uh, concludes our tour of the Groby Optimizer.